and I haven't heard from Husby. Welcome uh, to this uh, liver cancer program seminar series of this month. And I am uh, Xinwei Wang, I'm uh, the co-director of the NCI liver cancer program. Today, we, uh, in, uh, the welcome our uh, the speakers, Dr. Bernie Reddy, um, uh, who will be uh, the, uh, giving a talk on the clinical side, particular imaging side in terms of management of um, uh, patient with cancer. Now, Dr. Reddy earned her uh, doctor degrees in medicine from Columbia University, University, uh, New York City. After completing her internship and in internal medicines at the Columbia, uh, the Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City, she completed her residency in diagnostic radiology uh, at the uh, Montefiore Hospital in Albert Einstein, again in, in, in the New York uh, City where she has then served as the chief resident. Uh, Dr. Reddy then subsequently trained as an MRI magnet, uh, the fellows at the Wales Medical College of Cornell University in New York. And before then moved to um, uh, Santa Fe uh, in New Mexico for her uh, clinical uh, uh, duties. And she served as the um, as a director of staff uh, 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 radiologist and the acting chair of the radiology for the U.S. Indian Health Service, uh, New Mexico. So uh, Dr. Reddy will provide extensive knowledge in terms of uh, the imaging uh, modality to use for uh, diagnosis a patient with cancer. So without further ado, Dr. Reddy. Great, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And again, thank you for the invitation to speak on the topic of liver imaging, reporting, and data system implications for patient care. The successful prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of patients with liver cancer require input from many branches of healthcare. Today, I hope to give you a better understanding of the role of one of the team members, diagnostic radiology. Diagnostic radiology has a key role in establishing the diagnosis and staging of liver cancer. The LIRADS criteria are the guidelines used by diagnostic radiologists for making an accurate imaging diagnosis. A discussion of primary liver cancer remains an important topic because the incidence of liver cancer is increasing worldwide. When we talk about liver cancer, we're mostly talking about hepatocellular carcinoma because it is by far the most common form of liver cancer accounting for approximately 90% of cases. HCC is definitely a global problem, but the etiology does vary by region. For example, in North America and also in Japan, hepatitis C um, are the, is the leading etiology, whereas in East Asia, hepatitis B is the leading etiology. Uh, worldwide, however, um, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis uh, is increasing. Identification of a liver mass on an imaging modality like CT or MRI is a key component of the diagnosis of HCC. Most patients with HCC have cirrhosis. However, the morphologic changes of the liver, the nodularity, the heterogeneity associated with cirrhosis makes the diagnosis of HCC more challenging. It's more difficult to pick out a malignant nodular focus in a liver with multiple nodular foci as seen in a cirrhotic liver compared with a non-cirrhotic appearing liver. Accurately distinguishing the several different types of benign and malignant nodules that can occur in a cirrhotic liver is also an issue. Imaging is needed to accurately stage disease burden and therefore it help, helps determine eligibility for transplantation, options for local and regional therapy and the need for systemic therapy. However, the criteria for the imaging diagnosis of HCC have not always been well-defined. A pre-LIRADS retrospective review of radiologic staging data 
from the liver transplant database of patients with untreated HCC who underwent a liver transplant between 2003 to 2006, concluded at that time that the imaging requirements for radiologic stage prior to liver transplantation were unacceptably inaccurate for two reasons. One, 20% of the patients um, that were given high priority on the transplant list did not have HCC on um, pathologic evaluation of the liver. And overall accuracy where radiologic staging matched pathologic staging was only 44%. Recent data suggests that since the implementation of standardized criteria in 2013, with other changes um, in allocation policy, the rates of false positive diagnosis for transplant patients have fallen to less than 1%. LIRADS first started to take shape formally in 2008 with the support of the American College of Radiology. Uh, the standards were then developed by a large multidisciplinary consortium, including radiologists, surgeons, pathologists, hepatologists. Uh, the criteria have been uh, developed and defined over many years. The LIRAD standards are now uh, incorporated into several uh, clinical practice guidelines. So what is LIRADS exactly? LIRADS is a comprehensive system of imaging standards used for the non-invasive diagnosis of HCC. They are, there are four algorithms um, that are currently available. There's an algorithm for imaging surveillance and screening of HCC uh, in high-risk patients using ultrasound. There's an algorithm there are algorithms for the use of uh, contrast enhanced ultrasound, CT and MRI in patients at high risk for HCC. And there's also an algorithm for assessing response to treatment of HCC for local therapies. But this, um, this algorithm actually does not yet apply to systemic therapy. <clears throat> Standards include a lexicon and a uh, and define specifics of imaging technique, interpretation, reporting, and data collection for imaging studies. I'll be mainly focusing on the um, algorithm for uh, CT and MRI and briefly touch on ultrasound. The most important guiding principle for applying the LIRADS criteria is only use the criteria for analysis of high-risk patients. This means the LIRADS criteria can only be applied when the patient has a pretest probability of HCC that is sufficiently high and the likelihood of non-malignant lesions resembling HCC on imaging sufficiently low. Only then can HCC be diagnosed with confidence. The pretest probability is high enough in three groups of patients. Patients with cirrhosis from hepatitis B, C, um, alcohol-related uh, cirrhosis, NASH, autoimmune hepatitis, and these other etiologies here. In addition, we apply it in patients with chronic hepatitis B without cirrhosis, and those patients that have a personal history of uh, current or prior HCC. It's also important to know when we don't apply it. And we don't apply it in patients with liver disease less than 18 years old, patients with congenital uh, liver disease secondary to congenital hep uh, hepatic fibrosis or cirrhosis due to vascular disorders. Patients with cirrhosis secondary to vascular uh, disorders have a propensity, first of all, their risk of developing um, HCC is low, but they also have a propensity to, to develop um, hypervascular nodules that can actually mimic HCC. And also, um, we do not apply it to hep C patients without cirrhosis. So this is different from hepatitis B patients. So why use these inclusion criteria? 70 to 90% of patients with HCC have underlying cirrhosis. 
HCC is by far the most common cancer in cirrhosis and imaging can provide near 100% uh, percent positive predictive value for HCC in patients with cirrhosis. Patients that have chronic hepatitis B um, or are chronic hepatitis B carriers have an elevated risk of developing HCC even in the absence of cirrhosis because hepatitis B is a DNA virus that can integrate into the host genome, inducing insertional mutations leading to oncogenic activation. 20 to 50% of chronic hepatitis uh, B carriers with HCC have no cirrhosis, and HCC is the most common cancer in chronic hepatitis B carriers. We will start by first looking at the use of ultrasound uh, for HCC screening. The goal of ultrasound is to identify patients with early HCC because patients with early HCC have a better prognosis than patients with uh, late uh, stage disease at the time of diagnosis. So we gather a general population. We identify the high risk patients in that population. These patients undergo a screening ultrasound every six months. Uh, if a solid nodule is identified within the liver on screening ultrasound, they undergo additional diagnostic imaging with CT or MRI. Contrast enhanced ultrasound can also be used. Um, <clears throat> high serum alpha fetoprotein levels can also be used as, as sort of a uh, screening test and uh, in these patients with elevated alpha fetoprotein. They can also go directly to CT or MRI for additional evaluation. Any solid liver nodules less than a centimeter in size can be followed uh, uh, with um, ultrasound. So how good is uh, surveillance imaging with ultrasound? The highest level of data supporting HCC surveillance comes from a randomized controlled trial performed in China, published in 2004, looking at almost 18,000 individuals with hepatitis B infection. HCC-related mortality was found to be decreased by 37% in patients randomized to surveillance compared with those who were not screened for HCC. However, additional data has not been as positive. Um, a meta-analysis study from 2018 found ultrasound alone has a low sensitivity of approximately 45% for detecting HCC in patients with cirrhosis. The addition of uh, serum alpha feeder protein testing to the ultrasound uh, screening improved sensitivity to 63%. And then there was a VA study from uh, 2018 that found no association between screening for HCC with ultrasound and or alpha fetal protein and reduced cancer-related mortality in patients with cirrhosis. So why isn't ultrasound a more uh, robust screening tool? Ultrasound is operator dependent and because of that, it's not highly reproducible. Ultrasound has a poor performance in um, NASH patients and obese patients, meaning patients with hepatic steatosis. In patients with hepatic steatosis, it's technically more difficult to penetrate um, liver parenchyma with the ultrasound waves. It's more difficult to see the entire liver and the internal architecture. So this is an example of a patient with hepatic steatosis. Uh, you can see these areas of shadowing where we're not getting a good look at the liver parenchyma. Um, our evaluation of the posterior margin of the liver is limited, as opposed to a patient without hepatic steatosis where we can clearly see the diaphragm um, and we can identify uh, vessels within the liver parenchyma. We're starting to see a little bit of um, kidney here on the right side. Now, <clears throat> The ultrasound screening results from China may have been much better than the VA results because the patients were more likely to have hepatitis B as the risk factor, not NASH or cirrhosis. And as I mentioned before, um, patients with hepatitis B 
or 20 to 50 percent um, uh, of those patients don't have cirrhosis. So it's po possible that more livers were sort of sonographically, sonographically normal, if you will, and HCC tumors were more easily identified. Um, however, shifting demographics now um, from viral etiologies to NASH as an increasing cause of HCC require attention uh, to this uh, issue with ultrasound. Uh, LIRAD's criteria have more recently been adopted for ultrasound. Uh, so there's optimism that the more rigorous LIRAD standards when applied to ultrasound may improve the sensitivity of ultrasound. So why not use CT uh, and MRI 100% for surveillance? Um, ultrasound is appealing because it's relatively inexpensive, readily available to patients. Um, nodules can be biopsied under ultrasound guidance. Uh, CT and MRI are more expensive, involve contrast administration, radiation exposure um, for CT is an issue. Uh, MRI uh, patients may have difficulty uh, due to claustrophobia. Uh, in the future, there may be something like a liquid biopsy or sort of a, a blood test um, uh, that identifies DNA fragments. But even here, it's likely that imaging would still be needed to confirm the actual location and size of the tumor. Now on to LIRADS for CT and MRI. So the first thing again is we confirm that the patient is actually high risk uh, with cirrhosis, um, chronic hepatitis B, or a uh, personal history of HCC. Uh, there are six diagnostic uh, uh, categories that are assigned based on the probability of malignancy. So we have LR1, um, definitely benign, LR2, probably benign. LRM refer refers to those um, uh, findings that are probably malignant, but don't have the typical um, HCC appearance. And then we have LR3, uh, intermediate probability, LR4, probable HCC, and LR5, uh, definite HCC. When we get into these categories, then we have a diagnostic table that helps us further. So to understand the imaging findings associated with the LIRADS categories, it's helpful to understand the process of hepatocarcinogenesis or the process by which normal hepatocytes become malignant. The process involves progressive cellular and molecular dedifferentiation of hepatocytes. At a molecular level, hepatocarcinogenesis is always multi-step or multiple molecular alterations are required. Um, alterations can be genetic with changes in the actual DNA sequence leading to changes in the structure and function of expressed proteins, or the alterations may be epigenetic due to modifications of the DNA, such as methylation, um, that modify gene activation, but don't change the underlying sequence, leading to increased or decreased expression of proteins. Um, but at a histologic level, um, hepatocarcinogenesis may be multi-step or de novo. Um, multi-step refers to the successive emergence within a uh, precursor nodule of a histologically definable, more aggressive inner nodule with a survival advantage, ultimately leading to a malignant nodule eventually sort of taking over. So <clears throat> for example, we'd go from a regenerative nodule to a low grade to a high grade dysplastic nodule, small HCC to a large HCC. So the molecular changes, we don't directly visualize these on imaging, but um, the histologic changes um, we often see, although we don't always see them, but we um, often see them. <clears throat> 
as the molecular changes become histologically more visible and we go from a cirrhotic nodule to a low-grade uh, dysplastic nodule to a high-grade dysplastic nodule, the uh, portal triads decline in density. The portal triad is made up of a hepatic artery, a portal vein branch, and a hepatic bile duct. So as the number of portal triads decreases, there's a slight uh, decrease in blood flow um, in the lead up to early HCC, which contributes to the washout appearance, um, a characteristic that's uh, evaluated on imaging. Then as we move from early HCC to progressed um, HCC, the number of unpaired arteries increases, uh, giving an, ap an appearance of arterial hyperenhancement on imaging, another uh, distinguishing uh, feature. A capsule also starts to form uh, at the small progressed stage, uh, another feature that we look for on imaging. Uh, the LIRADS table then takes these sort of criteria that uh, can be identified histologically and incorporates them. So we're looking for whether or not there's arterial phase hyperenhancement. We care about the size uh, of the observation and we look for a capsule or washout. In order to identify the features of arterial phase hyperenhancement, washout, and a capsule, a multi-phase dynamic pre and post contrast CT or MRI is needed. Contrast enhanced ultrasound can also be used. Um, a pre-contrast series um, is needed to know what the liver looks like before we give the injection of contrast. Um, a late arterial phase post-contrast series is needed to assess for arterial phase hyperenhancement, and then we have delayed phases to look for a capsule and washout. Uh, on um, MRI and also on CT, we routinely acquire um, two delayed phases, um, uh, post-contrast phases. One is a portal venous phase obtained at about 60 to 90 seconds after the injection of contrast. And then we have a true delayed phase that's obtained at about three to five minutes after the injection. So <clears throat> it's important to remember that the liver is a little bit different uh, from other organs and that it has a dual blood supply. So there's a portal vein supply that normally supplies about 75% of blood flow. And then there's a hepatic artery that supplies roughly about 25%. Um, this is relevant because when we obtain this first um, arterial post-contrast series, we're really trying to see both the hepatic artery and the portal vein. When analyzing the uh, images, we first confirm that there's an observation or a distinct focus that stands out. And the focus is called an observation, which is a little unusual, um, rather than a nodule or a mass or a lesion, because it, um, it may be a true lesion, uh, meaning that if we were to biopsy it, we'd find a, a pathologic abnormality there, or it can be a pseudo lesion, um, such as a perfusion alteration, so that if we were to biopsy it, um, there would be no pathologic correlate. Then we want to assess um, the size of our observation. We're looking um, for arterial phase hyperenhancement, uh, defined as greater than background enhancement. And then we're looking for washout, defined as reduced enhancement relative to background. Uh, and we're looking for a capsule, this smooth, uniform, uh, enhancing rim and uh, it is distinguished, uh, it has to be conspicuous enough that it, it is distinguished from sort of background uh, fibrotic septations. So this is an example of a LIRADS-5 
um, observation, pre-contrast uh, images. We see arterial phase uh, hyperenhancement here, uh, late washout and capsule. It measures two by 1.9 cm. So we're in this category here, arterial phase hyperenhancement greater than two centimeters. It has two features. It's a LIRETS-5 lesion. There are other sequences that we acquire, including uh, T2-weighted imaging and diffusion-weighted imaging. And um, we can see findings, um, ancillary findings on these additional sequences that uh, support our diagnosis. For example, on T2, we're looking um, for mild hyperintensity lever uh, relative to liver parenchyma. And then on um, the uh, ADC map, we're looking for restricted diffusion. This is a uh, LIRAS-4 lesion or probable HCC. So this is actually most conspicuous in this case on this portal venous phase because this does not demonstrate arterial phase hyperenhancement, uh, which we can confirm here with um, subtraction imaging. So now we're in the no arterial phase hyperenhancement, but we do have um, two additional major features making this a LIRAS-4. Uh, this is LIRADS-3, indeterminate for HCC, um, arterial phase hyperenhancement. It's less than two centimeters, but there's it's um, nothing on the, um, we don't see a capsule or washout on uh, delayed phase imaging. We don't see anything on restricted diffusion, and we end up in this box here. So HCC is the, is the only primary malignancy that can be diagnosed with imaging alone without a requirement for pathologic confirmation in high-risk patients. So how reliable are the imaging criteria for the non-invasive diagnosis of HCC? So here I've compiled three sources of data indicating the percentage of HCC or malignancy in general associated with each of the uh, LIRADS diagnostic categories. The LIRADS manual um, data are listed in gray. Um, Meta-analysis data from a review article published in Gastroenterology in 2019 based on LIRAS versions of 2014 to 2017 are listed in red and data from um, meta-analysis based on LIRADS version 2018 are listed in blue. So what percentage of observations turn out to be HCC in each of the categories? For LIRADS-5, it's 94 to 95% of the observations called LIRADS-5 are HCCs. So LIRADS-5 has a high specificity, but it's not 100%. Um, LIRADS-4 is 64%, LIRADS-3, 31 to 38%, LIRADS-2, 0 to 16%. I just want to point out that this actually improved with the newer version of LIRADS, uh, so there were no sort of false positives there. Um, uh, uh, and LIRADS-1. Um, a small percentage of non-HCC cancers occur in most categories. Uh, uh, not uh, major, but there are, there are some. Um, and finally, I'd like to just draw your attention to this last uh, area here, um, this LIRADS M group. So these are the liver observations that look like cancer, uh, but are not typical of HCC. Um, as you uh, can see, there's a significant percentage of, um, of these that turn out to be HCC, about 33 to 37% turn out to be HCC, but don't look as we expect. I'm sorry, I meant to, um, uh, I think I misspoke on LIRADS too, but I'm gonna move on. Uh, uh, several international um, uh, societies have, um, uh, develop guidelines in addition to the uh, LIRADS for uh, non-invasive uh, diagnosis of HCC. 
The criteria uh, vary between um, geographic areas so as to address different target populations, resources, and um, treatment practices. So um, meta-analysis um, uh, from LIRADS 2018 version found that LIRADS 5 category has a 91% specificity and a 70% um, sensitivity. The LIRADS algorithm um, favors high specificity. And the reason is because the leading risk factor um, uh, in the US um, uh, for HCC is cirrhosis and liver transplantation is a preferred treatment if the patient is eligible. So the LIRADS algorithm tries to minimize the li um, likelihood of a false positive reading because um, livers for transplant are in limited supply. As a result, the imaging criteria are more stringent. The other um, issue is that we tend to use an extracellular contrast agent such as gadivist um, because uh, uh, these patients have more cirrhosis. Um, the extracellular agents are blood pool agents and don't depend on functioning hepatocytes, which can be a problem in patients with cirrhosis. In the parts of the world where hepatitis B with or without cirrhosis is the main risk factor, imaging favors high sensitivity uh, to maximize early detection for uh, primary resection or uh, local regional therapy. Um, this um, results in um, the criteria being broader because they're trying to select for sensitivity and hepatobiliary agent use um, like an agent um, EOVIS, which is more sensitive for the early detection of HCC um, is often used because these patients are light, less likely um, to um, have cirrhosis. However, um, hepatic function needs to be um, relatively optimal, not 100% perfect, but um, EOVIS does re, uh, depend on hepatic um, function in order to be most effective in diagnosing disease. For the final minutes of the talk, I'd like to fo uh, focus on this LIRADS M diagnostic category, a group that refers to tumors that look malignant but are not necessarily HCC. So, in patients with cirrhosis, HCC is by far uh, the leading cause of cancer. Intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma accounts for approximately um, 6%, and uh, a combined HCC CCA accounts for approximately 4%. Uh, metastatic disease and uh, lymphoma are relatively rare in uh, patients with cirrhosis. In general, approximately 10%, but up to 30% of HCCs lack the hallmark imaging characteristics. These atypical features um, often end up in this um, LIRADS M category. This is an example of a LIRADS M tumor. Um, some uh, LIRADS M tumors uh, have this appearance of, of rim enhancement uh, with uh, rim washout on uh, delayed uh, post-contrast imaging with this kind of delayed central enhancement or, or what's called a targetoid appearance. Uh, in this, this patient's tumor also demonstrates um, restricted diffusion. And the leading differential diagnosis here is intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Um, atypical HCCs can also look like this, and so can combined um, uh, uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas and uh, HCCs. Now, this tumor is obvious, but sometimes uh, the LIRADS M tumors can be more difficult to diagnose. So I, I'd like to share with you the imaging stories of three of our patients to illustrate this point. 
So the first patient is a 73-year-old uh, Filipino female with a history of lip, uh, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, elevated LFTs, and alpha fetoprotein. Uh, she has suspected cirrhosis due to NASH um, with a negative viral serology. And she had a, um, an MRI uh, study performed in February 2020. We see this um, arterial um, phase hyper-enhancing observation. It measures 2.2 by 1.9 cm. It demonstrates um, late phase washout. This is a LIRADS-5 observation assuming cirrhosis from NASH. So the patient um, went on to um, uh, get an ultrasound in preparation for an ultrasound guided biopsy. So this sort of illustrates one of the issues with ultrasound. There's, a, there's enough heterogeneity in the liver parenchyma here that it's difficult to find this observation that we know is there. Uh, but this we know the sort of location of the observation. So a biopsy was performed. Uh, the biopsy came back atypical lymphoid infiltrate, so not HCC. Um, cirrhosis was identified and minimal um, steatosis was also noted. It turns out also that the patient is having a rising elevated um, or rising alpha fetoprotein level. Initially uh, 67 in October of um, 2019, but now over 1600 in March of uh, 2020. So uh, serafinib uh, systemic therapy is started. And the patient returns and has a follow-up MRI study. This is an arterial phase image. It looks, things are looking very good. Uh, the arterial phase hyper-enhancement or what we would attribute to tumor um, angiogenesis has gone away. Um, the only problem was that the patient's alpha fetoprotein initially went down, but then it popped up again. Uh, the levels, it never went back to, to normal by any um, stretch of the imagination, but it continued to rise. So uh, this area was then um, ablated by interventional radiology. And again, after ablation, alpha fetoprotein levels went down and, but then started to climb again. So um, what do we do at this point? We want the uh, first step is to go back and sort of look at the liver uh, more closely and see if there's anything there uh, that we've noticed, but we haven't found to be troublesome. I want to mention the patient actually did have some other additional biopsies uh, around this time that also came back negative. So we, we don't have an explanation at this point for this um, increasing alpha fetoprotein. So um, just to go back, uh, the um, original MRI that was done in February of 2020, we see this area region of arterial phase hyper enhancement. It doesn't have that typical appearance that I was telling you about earlier with a sort of late phase washout and a capsule. It has this um, central area that seems to not enhance. Uh, on imaging seven months later, it hasn't, it hasn't really changed dramatically, although the degree um, of arterial phase hyperenhancement seems to be increasing. So at this point, uh, we decide to get a uh, PET CT study to see uh, if PET could sort of elucidate anything. And um, there is this uh, focal region of FDG activity right in this area here. I want to point out that, so this is much more focal uh, um, rather than this kind of larger um, subtle region of um, hyper enhancement that we're seeing on the uh, MRI. So this is biopsy that was identified and biopsied. Um, I, uh, I think it was done under ultrasound, but it might have been CT. And this came back as a poorly differentiated HCC. 
Now, just a quick word about um, PET. Um, PET is not typically um, a first line imaging tool for HCC because um, HCCs, uh, the uptake varies um, um, somewhere between 50 to 65% of HCCs um, have positive uptake on uh, PET CT. And the increased uptake is um, often associated with uh, high grade tumors. So it's, it would be a consideration in high grade tumors. So the patient's systemic um, uh, therapy uh, was switched after, uh, uh, and the patient's alpha fetoprotein has re returned to normal. So in this one patient, there are two tumors in the same patient, in the same organ, at the same time, demonstrating distinctly different imaging and histologic characteristics and different responses to therapy. Our next patient is a 68-year-old uh, uh, male from Mongolia, diagnosed with HCC in 2011. Uh, the tumor was resected uh, in 2011, and the patient experienced a recurrence in um, October of 2019. Of interest, there are no known risk factors other than the patient's um, personal history of HCC, but the patient did have a brother that um, died from cirrhosis. So uh, this is the outside um, uh, uh, CT scan that was obtained. The patient had two uh, liver masses. Um, uh, th these are the masses in the coronal plane. These are the same two masses in the um, axial plane. Interestingly, it was probably the patient's gallstones that um, sent the patient to the emergency room. Uh, but these two um, masses were resected, and the patient did very well until October 2019 when he came in for his um, CT scan. And uh, there's a large mass here uh, that's uh, right in this sort of tumor bed uh, where this previous tumor was sort of resected. This is um, uh, where the patient has his recurrence. It's, uh, this recurrence is infiltrating um, the adjacent gastric antrum. And what's sort of interesting about this tumor, this is um, on CT, we're not, we're not seeing that sort of distinct arterial phase hyperenhancement or distinct washout. This is actually probably necrosis within the tumor. So I would put this into the category of atypical um, HCC uh, in terms of imaging. And uh, this was resected and noted to be a sarcomatoid HCC. So the patient returns for um, a post-op scan approximately 10 weeks out, uh, the beginning of January, 2020. And we see these sort of nodules in the tumor bed region. It's difficult at this point to know if these are recurrent disease or um, if this is sort of post-operative change, a normal uh, post-operative seroma here. However, when the patient returns at the end of April, there's clear uh, tumor progression um, with um, infiltration of the uh, chest wall um, uh, at a couple of sites along here, but marked interval increase in uh, tumor burden. The patient also had um, metastatic disease within the uh, chest and abdomen that had progressed. So the patient was, this was treated with uh, radiation, a combination of radiation and systemic therapy. And actually this, this all responded nicely to um, the treatment regimen. Um, unfortunately though, the patient developed sort of progressive um, uh, liver failure over this time, going from April of 2020 to approximately 10 months later, the liver um, became smaller in size, more um, cirrhotic, the spleen became uh, larger, findings suggesting increasing portal hypertension, and um, there's significantly more ascites uh, in February of um, 2021. 
And here, I just want to remind you of what the original tumors look like. So in summary, the, the primary and recurrent tumors look and behave very differently, requiring different diagnostic interpretations and uh, treatment options. Our next patient is a 60-year-old uh, Caucasian female with the history of cirrhosis from alcohol abuse and HCV. The patient um, reported that she had treatment for the hepatitis C and that um, her viral load was negative. Um, an outside MRI study uh, noted two LIRADS4 observations or probable HCC. So the um, original outside study was obtained in August of 2019. And there um, is one observation here that demonstrates um, some arterial phase hyperenhancement, but it's uh, definitely more conspicuous on the portal venous phase here. No obvious um, sort of capsule or washout. When the patient returned in June uh, uh, to NIH, the patient actually had an outside study um, uh, in May uh, and then had another, end up another study in June at NIH. And I'll show you why in a minute. Um, so this um, observation here that was noted um, in August of 2019, it hasn't changed significantly in size. Uh, the overall appearance has changed a little bit where there's now this kind of uh, rim enhancement with um, um, less enhancement centrally, but the overall size hasn't changed. Uh, and then on the um, August 2019 study, there was also this other um, region in the posterior aspect of the right lobe of the liver, small degree of arterial phase hyperenhancement. On the portal venous phase, it looks like it's uh, got some ring enhancement. Maybe uh, there's um, some uh, washout here. So now these um, LIRADS observations, they were both um, reported as LIRADS-4 observations. And normally after a LIRADS-4, uh, there, there are a couple of options. You would think about uh, doing a biopsy conceivably. Uh, you would think about doing maybe short interval possibly short interval follow-up imaging, depending on the scenario. However, the patient lost um, her insurance in the interim here, and then um, COVID came into play. So uh, things were um, delayed. And uh, unfortunately for the patient, there was a marked progression of tumor in this um, uh, area posteriorly here in the right lobe, where the patient now has extensive um, infiltrating tumor with uh, evidence of portal um, tumor thrombus within the portal vein. So marked um, uh, progression. So at this time, it's difficult to predict um, to tumor behavior, particularly a typical um, appearance of tumor on imaging. It's hard to know which one of these is actually sort of going to take off. So what options are in the pipeline for um, further imaging related tumor characterization, particularly for so small tumors that would allow us to predict uh, tumor behavior and prognosis? The emerging fields of radiomics and radiogenomics as discussed in this um, article by the NIH team of Megan Bell, Evram Turk, uh, Turkbay and uh, Freddy Escorcia are uh, promising works in progress. Uh, radiomics is the process of extracting and analyzing imaging data that can't be seen by the naked eye, uh, but nonetheless can be identified and correlated uh, with uh, genetic and uh, phenotypic uh, characteristics of tumor. Advances in imaging software capability that now allow for more detailed uh, quantification of liver iron and fat content, including within tumors, um, 
improved uh, high temporal and spatial resolution imaging that allow for detection of more subtle uh, tumor angiogenesis and improved diffusion weighted imaging will also um, uh, improve our ability to further characterize tumors. So in conclusion, um, LIRAD standards are extremely valuable for the diagnosis and staging of HCC tumors with typical uh, imaging characteristics. Now